dispatch pickup of a weighted dummy by airplane shows a possible way to rescue airmen forced down in inaccessible places. A more advanced test is made with a live sheep, especially chosen because of its weak and delicate anatomy. The sheep returns, none the worse for wear, says here, setting the stage for experiments with human beings. Experiments were conducted by the Air Technical Service Command. There seems to be some doubt whether the tests are for rescuing personnel or to discourage them from getting lost. The snatch is made at 130 miles per hour, indicated airspeed. The subject of a pickup gains altitude smoothly after a slight vertical rise. Meanwhile, the plane climbs until it's just above stalling speed. Special braking equipment pays out nylon rope, gradually reducing the pay until the subject is speeding through the air at the same speed as the plane. Reeling is done by an electric reeling motor weighing 200 pounds. It takes two minutes and 45 seconds from the time a man leaves the ground until he's inside the plane. For rescue purposes, an experimental kit has been devised containing necessary equipment for the pickup. The kit can be dropped by parachute and carries simple instructions for harness adjustments and for putting up the poles and nylon loop. Project engineers consider the test successful. In Italy, once known as the land of wine and song, an Air Force unit needs to protect its planes from enemy bombing and fragmentation. So, they just roll out the barrel. Barrels like these 50-gallon hogsheads, formerly used for aging Chianti wine, and build themselves a U-shaped revetment. After the first row has been set in place, a steam shovel fills the barrels with earth. Then a bulldozer hills up the earth over the first tier of barrels. In that way, it's comparatively easy to roll the next tier uphill into place. Of course, as the barrels are filled, the earth must be tamped down solid. A wooden tamper does the job. After the earth is well packed down, sandbags are carted in and beaten flat to top off the revetments. The finished job as neat a U-shaped revetment as if it came right out of the book. All that remains is to jockey the plane into place behind the earthwork, where it's safe from anything but a direct hit. Of course, sometimes you have to wait for empty barrels, because there aren't enough GIs around to drink the Chianti. Films from the gun cameras of the 8th Air Force Fighter Command operating against Nazi aircraft and ground targets.
demonstration of the Nazi midget demolition tank captured both in Italy and in France. Loaded with explosives, the tiny tank can be sent against selected targets by radio control. This device appears to be expendable. A larger type can be retrieved by radio after discharging its load of explosives. Troops in this area call it the doodle bug. And here, one of the GIs goes for a ride. At the rear of the small model is a reel with about one half mile of cable, possibly as one means of transmitting power to the robot. The white stripes are used as sights by the operator. Final steps in hooking up the radio controls. The compartment normally containing the TNT, which is specially shaped for this purpose. Between 60 and 100 pounds are carried by the doodle bug. The larger types drop their explosive by means of an arm attached in front. 24 volt batteries are used to drive the motor. One slightly bigger tank can be controlled either by a driver or by radio. The Germans are known to have designed several models of the radio control tanks. Vast shipments of supplies are brought up close to the lines as the hour for the new Western Front Offensive nears. A railhead company sets up a Class I food supply dump with enough provisions to feed a million men for one week. Here, artillery ammo is buried in caches along roadways pointing toward the front. The hollow U trenches protect the shells from artillery fire. Advancing units can replenish their ammo stocks from these roadside ASPs without undue halt. On the Third Army front, the drive to the Tsar has given impetus with the elimination of the fortress of Metz. In this action, Mezier le Metz, north of the city, is being fired upon from emplacements at the Hermann Goering steel mill. Elements of the 90th Infantry Division are ready to enter Mezier le Metz. Final shelling of the town is directed by the 7th Field Artillery Observation Battalion. Inside the battered town, the medics evacuate engineers who were wounded while demining the area around one stubborn point of siege. Metz and its outlying forts constituted a formidable obstacle before which the Third Army had been held up since mid-September. The gradual collapse of Metz defenses terminates the French city's long reign as Western Europe's strongest fortress. Infantrymen take cover as they move through the streets, alert against snipers who may have been left behind by the retreating Nazis. A typical fort, strengthened by the Germans after its capture from the French. Active resistance in Metz ended 22nd November. First Army activity on the Hürtgen Forest Front, through which our troops have been fighting since crossing the German frontier in September. Tanks pace the advance of an infantry division. Fighting in this wooded terrain is southeast of Aachen, where a new Allied drive begins on 16th November.
British 2nd Tactical Air Force prepares barrage balloons, which will be floated along the front lines of the 1st Army sector. They'll form a bomb line to designate location of our own troops during the aerial assault preceding the move up of ground forces. Fifteen balloons will go up for this purpose, with a spare inflated on the ground in case one is shot down. Beginning at 11.15 hours on the 16th, bombers of the Allied Air Forces, escorted by fighters, dropped thousands of tons of fragmentation and incendiary bombs on fortified positions east of Aachen. The air attacks continue for one and a half hours. Ground forces begin their drives at 12.45 hours, aiming at Duren and Yerlich on the rear river line before Cologne. The attacks are launched jointly by the 1st and 9th U.S. Armies. North of these troops are the Tommies of the British 2nd Army. The advancing Americans encounter extensive fields of ingeniously placed mines which impede the progress of men and machines. Combat engineers clear and mark the mined areas. The forward push is a case of half a mile and half a village at a time. Flanking movements bring our troops into the backyards of small dwellings where they take advantage of whatever natural concealment is available. The 1st and 9th Army lines swing forward on a tight 25-mile front as many small towns fall in the face of the opening push. Three American armies of the 12th Army Group have now taken approximately 400,000 prisoners since D-Day. In the fighting near Breinig, Germany, medium tanks add their 75 millimeter guns to the artillery barrage. Their long-range coordinated fire against German positions facing the 1st Army is directed like field artillery from tank command posts. Ammo is stacked up near the tanks as the crews await the order to open fire. 